And this month's Where Did the Road Go is sponsored by Super Inframan, Allison Cook, and Eric Hervin. Thank you all so very much for your incredible support. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And tonight I'm very excited to have as my guest, Jay Douglas Kenyon. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing good. How are you, Soraya? I'm great, actually. Um, I've been wanting to talk to you for a while and you just put this book out called Ghosts of Atlantis, How the Echoes of Lost Civilizations Influence Our Modern World. And uh, you put this out. This came out through uh, Bear and Company. Yeah. And uh, this book is absolutely fantastic. It is a very full 436 pages. And you touch on everything in this book, it seems like. Uh, we've uh, we spent a long time uh, covering a lot of these subjects in uh, Atlantis Rising, and so once we came up with the idea of putting it all together, then we had a lot of ground to cover. So, so give people a little bit of your background. Well, of course, my main calling card is I was the editor and publisher of Atlantis Rising magazine, which started in uh, 1994. Earlier, I had uh, I had always been fascinated by the Atlantis idea for many years. And uh, I did a, I mentioned this in the book, uh, we did a, a screenplay with the idea that we were going to do something that would be along the lines of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark or, uh, uh, you know, an action suspense adventure that would basically tell the story of Atlantis. And uh, the idea being that, uh, here you've got a group of people, in this case, who are uh, uh, in our present world who basically have a connection to Atlantis. And they end up discovering, uh, the, you might say, the fruit of seeds that were planted in Atlantis. And uh, it makes interesting drama, so that's what we did. And I had been working on that for quite a while, and that got me started on the magazine, and then subsequently in the magazine, we published uh, a number of books that were related to that. And, uh, and, uh, and so it went for about uh, 25 years. And so now we have kind of putting, uh, putting it all to, into a, some kind of a capstone here for um, Ghosts of Atlantis. Now, wh why did you stop publishing Atlantis Rising? Uh, we couldn't if <laughs> we couldn't make it work business wise anymore. Right. Basically, right. Yes, uh, it was our costs were going up and our revenue was going down. We had we had enjoyed uh, some success and we did okay, but then it, it we passed the point where that seemed to be happening. And of course, uh, publishing a, a you know in paper and ink is a lot more uh, financially challenging than. Uh, doing something electronically on the internet, which was what we're doing now. Uh, I'm not, uh, and of course it's, that's, uh, we're trying to get, uh, it up and running, uh, in, in that form. But, um, anyway, it, it became unsustainable, I guess is that it would be the easiest way to put it. And yeah. that's why we sad as it was, and it was very sad for us. We had to, uh, we had to cash in our chips. I have no idea how any magazine still published nowadays. And a good, and neither do I. I must say. I mean, people just—I mean, they—they they don't go to the stores looking for magazines or subscribe. They just go on the internet for all the stuff. Exactly. So. Yeah. The the whole print industry has, you know, has been thoroughly disrupted by uh, by the electronic medium. I don't know where it's going to take us all in the end. Yeah, yeah. And your book is out in print. Uh, is there an electronic copy, too? Is there an e-book? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, at present, you can um, you can get it, uh, like, say, for Kindle or for a variety of um, 
uh, of, in a variety of formats. It's also available in as an audio book. Oh, okay. And, and uh, yeah, and uh, and with a real live um, uh, announcer. I can't remember his name right now, <laughs> but he did an excellent job. And so uh, uh, that's uh, that's certainly well worth considering for people who want it in that form. Yeah, audio books are definitely becoming more and more popular. Yeah. I always wonder how differently we process stuff hearing it versus reading it. Yeah, it's definitely, I guess, probably a different part of the brain. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a different... Uh, uh, I'm thinking it's probably much more linear. Uh, the... Um, you know, the, the left and the right brain, the, the left brain is basically doing things in sequential uh, uh, verbal form. And the, the other side of the brain is looking at things more holistically. Uh, I, I, it, it came clear to me at one point that uh, it's those two different hemispheres that uh, when we put them together, that's when it opens up another dimension. When, there's, when those two different hemispheres are separated from each other, uh, then we, uh, we don't see things holistically. It's another way of thinking of it is just like 3D, you know, when you can see things in depth, which is what you get when you can see things with two eyes rather than just one. And it opens up the, uh, it opens up the depth. Yeah. So, uh, that's that's wandering a little afield from your <laughs> comment, but uh, <laughs> you'll have to put up with that with me. That's fine. In fact, last night we were talking about how our brains basically think in 2D, and you have to actually train it to think in three dimensions. Well, I think that it's, it's the product of our culture, and uh, by this I mean in the West, uh, we, have been, uh, we have been taught to... Uh, uh, to do the linear thing and think logically and uh, uh, mathematically and uh, and when I say mathematically I mean in uh, uh, numerically sequentially etc yeah whereas other cultures certainly in the east in India even in China so forth that at, at, at one point were more uh, uh, looking at things holistically or what we would call holistically now and it's putting those things together that uh it's it, it, well it gives us uh, a spiritual awareness which um is very difficult for most people in our culture to connect with and but it is the missing ingredient in my view no, um, i agree and so that's what you know Really, it's a matter of seeing the uh, uh, the the forest rather than the trees. It's, yeah, it's seeing the big picture and being able, therefore, to uh, uh, put it together coherently. Uh, John Michelle, who uh, I quote quite a bit in there, and who is one of the people I admire most on this subject, wrote a book called "View Over Atlantis" back in the '60s, and. His major point was that, or he mentions it in the book, is that, well, we, uh, we're, as we kind of climb the hill, returning to our previous state of awareness, we come to, uh, we're able to see uh, the, the bigger picture, because we, he, he was saying, we live in the ruins of a world which was so vast that it's been invisible up to now. It's only now that we finally get enough altitude that we can start to see um, we can start to see how the pattern comes together and and get the big picture. Now, in, in the book, one of the things you talk about uh, you, you talk about a lot in this book. This book has so much different stuff in it. It's just fantastic. Um, normally, a four hundred page book, I'll look at and be like. This is going to take forever, and I flew through this book. Um, I absolutely loved it. It's written in a very easy-to-read style. You go just enough in-depth into a bunch of different ideas to keep it uh, keep it interesting without bogging anything down. Well, and thank you. 
Um, one of the things you talk about early on is the destruction of the past and how we've, you know, we have seen so much of our past just wiped out um, and we don't even know what was lost at this point between cataclysms and like religious groups destroying stuff from, from the Spanish to what's happening in the Middle East right now. Um, you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, yeah, that's that's a very important part of it uh, be, because uh, we're talking about amnesia. Yeah. And uh, the idea is that uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, you know, wherever, whatever we came from, uh, our origins, we've lost touch with it. And uh, therefore, we, uh, and, uh, I quote a, a lot and rely a lot on the work of Emmanuel Vilikovsky. Mm -hmm. who uh who is uh wrote a book uh well it was uh, he didn't actually he it was kind of assembled from a lot of stuff that he wrote which was called mankind and amnesia and he was making the point that the psychological condition in case in case history if you will of the entire world is is really one of amnesia and if you and but the that's an easy concept to uh, to bat around, and there uh, there are many people who recognize that this is so, but the full implications of it uh, haven't really been taken in, and that is that we're scarred by that. Uh, we we basically uh, have only a partial awareness uh, that uh, enables us to uh, to face some of the records that we have to face. Uh, and think that's the reason for the name of the book, uh, Ghosts of Atlantis. I think of the the idea of the haunted house, uh, mm. and the, I think of the world as a haunted house. You know, the entire the entire culture, and and by that I mean you're talking about um, uh, a world where a lot has occurred and much of it painful, and it's been uh, and some of it excruciatingly painful, and it's something that is not easily dealt with consciously, so it gets uh, suppressed. And, and not only is it suppressed in the sense that it's denied by authority figures, but it then becomes um, against the law <laughs> to go that way. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it, it, because it, it, becomes, it becomes hardened into institutional... Uh, and I think if you really want to understand a lot of the uh, of the arguments that people make these days, and I'm including the category of uh, politically correct speech, it's like it's it's an attempt to basically block or deny uh, certain things that we know to be so, or that we have long believed to be so, and to now suddenly make them. Uh, you know, unutterable, you know, you can't, you're not supposed to talk about them because it triggers people. <laughs> right. It, in other words, it upsets people. And if you think about it, and of course that upset can be a very, is not a casual thing. It can be a very deep thing. And it certainly interferes with the powers that be and their ability to maintain their, uh, maintain their grip on, uh, on, on authority here. True. Um, and the role of cataclysm in our past has been severely underplayed. And I think that's one of the things that's so important about researching stuff like this is that if you listen to mainstream science, they'll, they'll tell you that everything happened very slowly and gradually. There's no real cataclysms anymore, but yet we see evidence of a massive cataclysm at the end of the last ice age and little ones after that as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I mean, the whole subject of catastrophism, and, it, and Vilikovsky was actually considered by many to be the, the father of catastrophism. I mean, he was like the first to really assert this, and he was saying, I think, his, I think the schedule that he was operating on or the timing was not, he, he, I think he made a lot of mistakes in that area. Right. But he had the, the basic idea he had was correct, and it goes back much further than... Uh, than he realized, but uh, you're talking about uh, the story of mankind on Earth uh, has been punctuated by catastrophic events. This, of course, was what uh, 
uh, Plato's ancestor Solon was told by uh, the priests of size in 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 Egypt that uh, that uh, history on Earth uh, there have been many destructions of uh, of civilization on Earth and uh, some by fire some by water uh, but uh, that was the the recurring theme and it seems to catch us unaware every time yeah. And uh, that's that, and hopefully, I mean, that's maybe we can uh, start if we can just start waking up and remembering some of this. Maybe we can, maybe we can uh, at least find a way to navigate uh, around uh, the full destruction of uh, of the world as we know it. Yeah, because we're not really paying any attention. Um, you know, you have anything from cometary impacts, asteroid impacts, to solar flares, and who knows what else that could happen at a moment's notice. And we're not prepared right. for any of it. And we, and there are ways, like for instance, to secure the uh, the power grid against solar flares, but we're not doing it. Well, think about why that would be, and uh, it, it it gets to this point of amnesia. That is, you people. Uh, these are difficult subjects and people don't want to think about it. Yeah. And, uh, thinking about it hurts. <laughs> it's scary. And, uh, but, uh, not thinking about it is worse. Yes. Yeah. I mean, because we don't have, as far as I know, we don't have a lot of backup generators or anything like that. If the, if these generators get hit and they go down, They'd have to be built from scratch, and if everything goes down, if we get hit by a massive solar flare and everything goes down, we're back to the the you know the Stone Age. You got it. And there's not, and uh, and but we'll be at least in the Stone Age. You know, everybody was kind of on the Stone Age footing, right? Uh, that whereas now everybody has been uh, has been. Um, uh, acclimated to uh, an, an, another way of doing things, and now to be deprived of all the uh, to, to be put in that position would be uh, it, it, it's 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 not something that is pleasant to think about. Yeah, yeah, and that's why it's so important that people know more about this stuff and realize that this stuff did happen at some point. I mean, we may not know exactly what happened because we've lost so much. But there's enough evidence of these cataclysms in our past that we should be paying attention because they could happen at any point. Um, That's right. And a lot of what we lost, like I said, the Spaniards, when they went into South America and Central America, destroyed so much of those, so many of those records. Um, you know, we lost the Library of Alexandria. We've lost so much different stuff over the years. And there's always the, the, the Hall of Records idea that Edward Casey presented. And uh, what, what is your take on that, that there might be a, a hidden store of information out there still? Well, I think it's a possibility. Uh, we have a chapter in the book uh, dealing with some of the research from uh, Robert Schock and Robert Baval uh, and, uh, it, and, it, and uh, Dr. Uh, Sefreda, I forgot, uh, Manny Sefreda, uh, basically... Uh, looking at evidence that uh, maybe in um, around in the vicinity of the Sphinx, uh, there was a uh, there was a a hall of records, and there are references that uh, there's discussions of this in like the Book of Thoth and a lot of other uh, sources. Uh, we we talk about this. Uh, I got a got a good chapter on this in the book. And uh, I think that uh, what uh, what Shock and and Boval are saying is that um, uh, there were hieroglyph hieroglyphs that tell us about a a um, a secret chamber that was maintained by perhaps the priesthood of uh, of uh, Egypt, and that uh, he, he, there's a some very uh, he there's evidence for uh, that it involved the a uh, a recumbent lion which was essentially sounds like the sphinx because the sphinx was um uh appears to have the body of a lion 
Right. And of course, the head, even though it was looks like a pharaoh, was recarved, obviously, uh, long after whatever was originally there. And and of course, when you start talking about um, uh, the Sphinx and particularly relating it to a lion, then you're immediately you're talking about the age of Leo, mm-hmm. and that's about halfway around the zodiac from uh, from our present position. Uh, about uh, so we're talking about twelve thousand, uh, uh, a little over twelve thousand years ago, and all of that aligns with the. Um, with the sinking of Atlantis, as described by Plato, and the uh, uh, the Younger Dryas uh, uh, end of the last ice age, and uh, and so I, I see all of this is coming together, and the idea that the ancients could have left some kind of a record that uh, we could um, that would give us a clue as to what happened and how to I mean that sounds to me like a it certainly sounds like a possibility. Yeah. And I, I don't, uh, I can't vouch for the idea, but then I can't vouch for many ideas, but they sound plausible. If I remember right, uh, Robert Schock had said, I don't remember if one, if it's when I had him on or if I just heard a, read something elsewhere, but he said initially when he got into researching the Sphinx, he didn't know anything about Edward Casey's work. And then there was some hint, I think, with the ground-penetrating radar, they found something under one of the paws. Yes. And then he found out about Edward Casey, and he's like, well, that's interesting, you know. And, but they've never been able to investigate it. And the question becomes, have have the Egyptologists, has some, some level of uh, the people in control there, actually investigated it and never released the information because it doesn't fit the paradigm? Well, it, it, there's, there's reason to be suspicious, uh, I, and he talks about this, uh, you know, in, in, we, in our chapter in the book, um, and I know that uh, when they were, in, he originally got involved uh, by following up on John Anthony West's uh, 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 argument about the water weathering of the Sphinx, and, yeah. and West, of course, got that from uh, Swallow de Lubitsch, and the... But Shaw came in as the geologist who could basically uh, verify that that was indeed uh, what the record shows there in the area of the Sphinx, a water water weathering in the middle of the desert. And uh, so uh, I think that uh, then as he got involved, they when when they went to Egypt and did a lot of their investigation, he did a lot of um, uh, he worked with uh, Thomas Dubecki, who was uh, a uh, uh, an expert on on some of this, and they did some. Uh, uh, they didn't do full ground penetrating radar, but they did a lot of uh, kind of uh, basic techniques involving creating uh, 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 sounds and getting the echoes, and then using that charting that to come up with the idea that there was indeed appeared to be some kind of a chamber uh, beneath the, uh, uh, the uh, apparently the left, I believe the left paw of the Sphinx, I forget which switch. Uh, and, and then he combined that with um, a lot of other uh, research. And he saw that that uh, basically kind of coincided with uh, some of the things that Edgar Casey said. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and so there was, and, and the Casey people were of course, very active in pursuing this. We, again, we talk about that in the book and, uh, uh Casey of course talked about a possibility of a, um, hall of records in uh, both in, uh, Egypt around, uh, somewhere around the, in the Giza plateau region. And he also talked about the possibility of one in the, uh, in the Caribbean, yeah. and uh, that that was that was something that uh, uh, has been pursued by a lot of people as well, and we we talk about both. Yes, yeah. Um, didn't Casey specifically say it would be under one of the paws of the Sphinx? I believe so. Yeah, uh, I, I, yeah. He, he had. Um, it's not, you know, like a lot of Casey's uh, statements. It, it's it's a little bit. Uh, 
it's a little bit vague. Yeah. Uh, it's it's kind of the his syntax which made things a little bit um, a little bit hard to to nail him down, but um, uh, that that was certainly uh, uh, what people read into that, and I and I think uh, with good reason. And the, the the thing with the Sphinx too is that despite Shock's evidence, despite geologists agreeing with him, Egyptologists still will not acknowledge the older date of the Sphinx. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that fits into the whole amnesia idea, uh, because you find people defending positions that are not justified based on evidence, but they're doing so because uh, it protects uh, a certain concept or paradigm that they're trying to preserve, uh, largely uh, to do with uh, the date or the timelines. Uh, you know, as Plato was clear, uh, Atlantis went down about uh, 12,500 years ago. Uh, which corresponds to the end of the last uh, ice age, but that is not an idea that is accepted by, you know, by mainstream archaeologies and the, uh, archaeology, and they want to say that uh, that uh, that we started uh, that before at that time we were only hunter gatherers, right? And we didn't have any uh, uh, coherent uh, uh, logical civilization. And that's where they wanted to, that's where they wanted, that's, that is the doctrine that they're basically propounding. And they insist that everybody agree to that. And if you won't agree to that, then they won't talk to you. Right. And right. Or they're going to uh, ostracize you and, uh, and send you, send you, uh, and exile you from the, from, from the uh, mainstream there. But at any rate, it, it, it's, the timeline is so critical, and if they, if if you accept the idea that uh, only that uh, uh, at that time that we were just hunter gatherers, in other words, living in primitive darkness, and that everything uh, that and and that everything we know that was in our civilization be, actually didn't begin till thousands of years later, and everything prior to that was just primitive darkness, that becomes. Uh, a very crucial point in their in their uh, in their scheme, and if you start to challenge that, then you start to shake up the whole thing. Uh, you know, if if I can uh, digress a little bit on this point, but in, in the book, I, I, I'm fond of talking about the uh, the book uh, Canical for Leibowitz. Did you ever read that by any chance? I don't think so. It's a great science fiction book from published in the 1960s by uh, 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 Walter Miller, I believe was the thing. But the, 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 the idea is that in the story, you're a few uh, hundred years in the future, uh, and you're dealing with a dystopian post-apocalyptic world uh, of following an atomic holocaust. And, of course, and the predicament that, I mean, you have a, a group of, um, of uh, monks in the desert who are basically uh, trying to, uh, uh, you know, achieve uh, sainthood for uh, their patron, uh, Leibowitz. Uh, they're out there in the desert and they're basically, they don't, they have a few clues to what world may have preceded them, but they don't understand it at all. And it's actually the story, you can see the parallels between their experience and the experience in our world and how certain kinds of knowledge are blocked, they're forbidden, and you won't, uh, uh, they're, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, 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 they're taboo. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not, you're not allowed to, to get into certain subjects or bring them up because of the implications. And anyway, uh, I, I, I see that as, as the story of our own time, uh, though I think you're talking about something that happened uh, many thousands of years ago and, uh, and not within the last few hundred years, and its, its effects are more, um, are more subtle 
and uh, and but they're 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 very well established. You know, they've they've been around for a long time. The uh, and, uh, and that's what we need to uh, to somehow or other wrap our uh, wrap our minds around. And and as much of a game changer as Gobekli Tepe should have been, it really wasn't. Well, there you go. I mean, Gobekli Tepe is is like the proof, if you want, the smoking gun for uh, what's wrong with the hunter gatherer theory. It's funny that they still talk about, okay, well, this was built by hunter gatherers, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> then, but what's the definition of hunter gatherers? Uh, you mean? <laughs> This whole idea that you can have an organized society involving thousands of people that can build vast structures demonstrating great discipline and great organization uh, and do so and then bury the whole thing. Uh, I mean, I think, uh, I think Graham Hancock has got it right uh, when he says that he thinks that the builders of Gobekli Tepe were essentially the the survivors of uh, whatever went before. And Gobekli Tepe represented this uh, attempt of theirs to kind of resurrect uh, a civilization in the wake of, uh, in the wake of uh, whatever it was that had happened. A lot of, uh, a lot of the prior world seems to have been in that, uh, in that vicinity. Yeah. Um, so let, let's jump over to this this particular case you covered in maybe Forbidden Science or Forbidden History, one of the two. Might, maybe it was Forbidden History. And for some reason, I was never able to find the article on it again, but it's something that always stuck with me, and that's Virginia Steam McIntyre. Oh, and yeah. She had the El Hemo tracks down in Mexico that were a quarter of a million years old, and she did all the science properly. And she was immediately blackballed, and her research was basically just thrown out. Yep, that's um, a big uh, a big scar, in my view. On uh, it, 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 the whole notion and uh, of that the uh, Clovis uh, horizon for civilization in America went only back about. 13,000 years. That's was the conventional wisdom for a long time. Right. And, uh, but, uh, that's been pretty much discredited. And now there's tons of evidence around, uh, that, uh, that went, that it went back much further. Uh, Steen McIntyre was brought in to, uh, examine some, um, records that were found in, uh, in Mexico. This was, uh, or excuse me, in New Mexico. Uh, oh, it was New Mexico. The, okay. Not, uh, El Horno. Well, no, it was Mexico. I'm sorry. And uh, uh, anyway, Wetlico. Um, and uh, she used the, all of the latest uh, technology and came up with about a quarter of a million years. And that, of course, was just totally unacceptable uh, to <laughs> the powers that be. And so they trashed her big time. And the thing is, she, impossible. and she wasn't like uh, someone who was trying to uh, redefine anything. She was playing by the rules. She wasn't like this uh, fringe researcher or anything like that. No. She had no agenda. Of, uh, uh, try and, but that's the way the game is played. So uh, her fate was... Uh, we talked about her several times in uh, both uh, in the uh, forbidden, uh, forbidden, mostly in forbidden science. But we okay. had several articles on, and Michael Cremo talks about her quite a bit in uh, some of his columns with us. And really, even Robert Schock. I mean, if people don't realize that Robert Schock was a very standard geologist, he wasn't necessarily interested in this stuff until John Anthony West got him into it. And I believe what he told me is he he said he figured John Anthony West was wrong because why would the Egyptologist not know this stuff? And you know, but hey, it's a free trip to Egypt and he gets to see the Sphinx, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I 
Shock went through uh, over the years that he wrote for us. He actually changed. He his his view of things evolved considerably. Yeah. Uh, initially, when he wrote, um, I've forgotten what the n- name of his first book was that that he did after this, and he was talking about the date for uh, for. Um, uh, he was more conservative about the uh, the meaning of the of the Sphinx, and then but he kept it. Uh, but West uh, uh, John Anthony West kept after him, and he kept uh, re-examining his uh, stuff, and he kept he kept moving his uh, his frontier. He kept uh, kept going back, and kept increasing the uh, the, uh, the the number of years involved. Yeah, I mean. There's plenty of evidence that uh, that uh, Egyptian civilization is much older. I tell you what, though, if if you really want to get uh, evidence of great antiquity, just look at India. Yeah, India is you know the whole uh, Vedic culture of India clearly goes back. Uh, you know, it frankly, it's it, it's it's got to be many thousands of years prior to uh, any of the uh, uh, standard chronology. And with with that, we also did not lose all the texts. That's one of the places that we do have texts that go, go back quite far, and most of it is just dismissed as, as myth. Right. <laughs> but that is so shallow. Uh, the, the, the depth and... Uh, and, and knowledge and sophistication that you find in the uh, uh, in the ancient texts is is incredible. Yeah. I mean, I, I listen a lot to uh, I don't know if you've ever you hear uh, uh, Nilish Oak, um, who is a who's an expert on this is in India, and I have a little trouble understanding his accent a lot, but he he's he makes he he shows how in the case of uh, uh, certainly the Mahabharata and uh, the Rig Veda and, and the others that um, there are many references to uh, astronomical events that can be that can be dated and tracked and uh, with precision uh, and that um, uh, it, it it clearly dates uh, the war of the uh, uh, the war in the Mahabharata uh, to thousands of years, many thousands of years BC, and of course, many of the uh, of the descriptions of an advanced civilization, which were part of that, are um, can be can be tracked with with precision. <laughs> yeah, but but uh, they don't want to they, they don't want to go there. And frankly, I, I think that the case can be made that uh, Indian civilization was the mother civilization of the of the planet, and that all of the great uh, all of the uh, the culture of the West basically uh, grew out of um, of uh, Vedic achievements. And but, do you think uh, do you think that tracks back to like pre Ice Age, or are we talking just yeah. like okay? I, I, I think so. I think so because I think that uh, I mean I I know this is not an area of expertise on my part. Not to say that any of these areas are. I'm I'm a generalist, right? Uh, and uh, but uh, I do think that uh, it it does go back to uh, before uh, to I, I'm convinced from what I hear uh, and people I respect and people I listen to that you can go back at, to probably maybe 17,000 years BC, mm. uh, which was certainly well before, uh, uh, the ice, uh, well before the, uh, younger dryas and so forth. Yeah. I think, I, I think it's really interesting when you start talking about, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Sarasvati river, yes. uh, the ancient river that, uh, flowed from, uh, from the Himalayas to the, uh, into the Indian Ocean there, uh, or uh, or is it? Uh, I'm thinking about uh, uh, the uh, the um, the Gulf of Cambay and some yeah, of the yeah. studies that 
some really good studies and really good uh, research has been done on that. Uh, some of this has been published on, on uh, Graham Hancock's site. And uh, we talk about it. I do talk about it in the book. Uh, but um, there's, there's plenty of, of evidence that, I mean, I think that something was there and the end of the Ice Age caused a great rise in sea levels. Uh, probably as much as several h- hundreds of meters. Yeah. And consequently, the, all of the coastal regions of the world were basically uh, went underwater and, uh, and are not now uh, very, very difficult to, uh, to, to bring them out and to open them up. Uh, and uh, we, I mean, we're getting bits and pieces of it here and there. But I think in India is uh, probably uh, uh, some of the best examples of it. Certainly, the um, uh, the uh, lo- lost city of uh, of Krishna. The uh, what is it? The uh, I'm not uh, very good with the. Uh, I, I know what the, you're talking with about the, with, with the Indian names, but uh, there uh, some of this came to light during the great uh, tsunami. You know, a few yeah. years ago. Yeah. Uh, and we're, uh, we're exposed. And of course, there, the irony, of course, is that e- the establishment in India is just as much a part of this uh, uh, establishment that blocks these ideas as in the West now, because they, they've identified with the, uh, with uh, uh, the, uh, actually, they identified with the, with the British uh, uh, point of view. And uh, and they're kind of uh, intimidated apparently by uh, arguing for for the seniority of their own culture uh, in this condition. But uh, but there you ha- but that's that's the w- that's the truth of it. And certainly India had very advanced science, made many great discoveries in mathematics and elsewhere, which are only now beginning to be really appreciated. Yeah, and I mean that there's the land bridge that went between Sri Lanka and uh, India. Yeah, that- that's a great one. And as a matter of fact, the uh, uh, the geologist uh, with uh, Badranarian Badranarian, who is uh, did a lot of research on that, uh, and basically uh, showed that there's a pavement uh, underneath uh, the this. Uh, uh, the land linking or the land link between uh, India and Sri Lanka, mm. and uh, of course his his work, which you would think uh, would be cheered by many of the Indian authorities, they basically uh, they don't want to have anything to do with him. Right, and yet he because he's the uh, <laughs> he's not uh, speaking the party line. Yeah. And that, that's what so much of it is. And how much do you think is also just down to people's egos and money and things like that that don't want, you know, where they don't want to see their own paradigms uh, reinvented, basically? Right. They don't want a disruption in their, in their, uh, in their supply, in their support system yeah. that, they, that they've invested in. And they basically secured themselves. And to, uh, I, I, that's certainly a lot of it. Uh, and if uh, to get the view from thirty thousand feet, uh, you know, is where you start to see how all of these things intersect and all contribute to this. Uh, uh, and they're part of a of a psychosis, in my view, which is it fits into this idea of amnesia. Uh, you get a, these are all different symptoms, if you will, of the condition. Mm. And uh, it, the, con- the the fundamental condition is the important thing to focus on here and that's the forgetfulness i remember also robert shock saying that when he initially made this you know verified that this was water damage he was excited he thought egyptologists would be excited because hey here's something new for you to look into and instead he was literally spit on right well it's (laughs) he he realizes uh 
he realizes now, I believe, that his uh, uh, his loyalty uh, was not. Uh, it's a it's a good thing he had his tenure before all of this began. True, very true. <laughs> they would have trashed him too, and I'm sure he knows that. Yeah, he's he's, he's definitely he's become a real thorn in their side because he's uh, and I mean he wrote. With us, he wrote dozens of articles on all kinds of subjects. You know, he's very much into uh, the paranormal, yeah, and uh, and uh, evidence for that. And uh, just like uh, uh, he knows that uh, a lot of that was uh, the evidence in the 19th century and so forth when this was originally being investigated was very good, very solid, very. Uh, uh, well uh, uh, mapped out, and yet it was rejected. It was totally rejected, not because the evidence was. I mean, the the they would say that uh, oh well, there's a flaw there. It's never been proven, etc. That's nonsense. Yeah, it's as proven. It's as well proven as all kinds of things that are stated as fact by the establishment. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, like I, I, I've said for a long time, there's more evidence, scientific evidence for psi than there is for something like dark matter. But dark matter is fully accepted and psi is, is laughed at. Exactly. You have, <laughs> you're exactly right. And it's because the implications of one are different from the implications by the other. Yeah. They don't want anything that implies a spiritual reality. Right. They don't want to go there. They do not want that. They, because they've liberated themselves, they feel from this. And a lot of this began in, you know, in the 19th century when uh, basically uh, the religious, uh, uh, the religious fundamentalism, if you will, was overthrown. And legitimately so. I mean, there were certainly, but they wanted that freed them up. And uh, they're not, they, and they don't want to go, they don't want to talk about anything that they think suggests that maybe there was a spiritual cause. In right. other words, the idea that there was a God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, also, also that, anything that's outside material reality. Exactly. It's the materialist, materialism versus spirituality. That's the fundamental dichotomy. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's sort of understandable early on because science was, you know, a new thing. Religion had sort of the sway over the people, and you know, you did they didn't want to give the Bible thumpers anything to kind of like grasp onto, you know. So they didn't want to acknowledge evidence of a flood or anything like that. But at this point, that's that's not something that should be continuing. It's just saying that became ingrained. Exactly. No, you're at, that's you. That's exactly right. And uh, they, they, there was a, um, uh, there was a change or a, uh, a turning, a turning of the tide that occurred at the time. And then, basically, it was like they were building all kinds of structures to keep the tide from going back the other way. Yeah. <laughs> and it's and and completely throwing out the actual scientific method and only using it when it when it fit their their beliefs exactly and that is definitely something that we just that's going on all the time yeah well let's 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 talk a little bit about hapgood and the uh potolan maps okay because uh these these of course are, are very interesting maps that are seemingly very accurate and show things like antarctica without ice on it and which means they're they're fairly old i mean the last time a lesser Antarctica had no ice was during the last ice age. Right. Well, I think uh, Hapgood in that case is relying very much on the, uh, the Puri Reese map. Uh, there's, uh, however, there's plenty of evidence that the Puri Reese map was actually a uh, part of a much larger map uh, that was, uh, that has been lost. Uh, one that apparently Columbus had, and I, that uh, Ed was basically part of what uh, um, he followed, which uh, led him to America. And uh, but of course, the Puri Reese map, like most of those maps, was copied from earlier maps. 
and uh, the general uh, belief is that they were uh, from the uh, that they had been kept in the library at Alexandria, and that they had been uh, uh, they had been copied. Uh, in our uh, uh, we focus a lot on research that was done on the so-called portalons, uh, which were uh, maps that were uh, uh, during the during the Middle Ages were were basically uh, before they had the uh, the ability to uh, project like in the Mercator projections and so forth, uh, that uh, they basically would uh, show distances from port to port on maps. And so those maps became, uh, uh, they were actually national treasures uh, of, for, the, for the many people who used them. And, but we do not, and they had, a lot of them were very accurate. And nobody knows how that was possible because, and in fact, the researchers that I mentioned, and I can't uh, forget the guy's name, who uh, did a lot of this research, was able to show that uh, even though, uh, well, to show that the distances that were claimed between the ports were more accurate than were, had been actually demonstrated by their actual travels. In other words, they were coming up with uh, with sources that were uh, were older or more. Uh, uh, there was another source that they were using that was more authoritative than their own experience. Right, and and this was evidence of the use of maps that were older and were not. Uh, we know them, so there's evidence that the maps were there. We just haven't. In many cases, we haven't seen the actual maps, but we've seen evidence of their existence. And then Charles Hapgood basically uh, got into this um, back in the uh, 60s. He was a cartographer himself who was basically um, uh, had uh, wrote, uh, wrote a book uh, called Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings, and he also... Uh, believed uh, in the in that the the Earth's crust was shifting, which was one of his his uh, his big things. But Hapgood was was uh, not just an ordinary college professor from an uh, obscure New, New England school. He was actually an advisor to presidents, and he actually uh, wrote to, to Eisenhower about the existence of uh, uh, of, uh, of these maps. And uh, uh, so the call, so-called Mapa Mundi, or a world map that that he believes that uh, uh, Columbus used. And um, at any rate, he was a much more controversial figure. And so some of the uh, more recent research, which verifies the validity of the portalons, they don't want to go there in terms of the of the Hapgood maps. They don't want to talk about it. But there's a clear connection. And uh, they can't really avoid it. And so uh, Hapgood was, uh, was uh, quite, a, quite an amazing uh, uh, character. He came up with a lot of uh, really amazing stuff. And he thought that uh, he believed, and he, he was one of the first to say that the Piri Reis map showed the uh, coast of Antarctica beneath the ice. Therefore, as evidence of a seafaring civilization that existed um, before the end of the last ice age. Yeah. And he also uh, wrote about pole shifts and stuff. And right. that, that is part like that's, that always fascinated me because it seems like such an Occam's razor sort of explanation for certain things. Like why lesser Antarctica had no ice during the last ice age, why Siberia was warm during the last ice age. It's kind of like, well, if you move to pole, the way the magnetic pole is, everything kind of lines up. Yeah. Well, I think, and he, and uh, I did, uh, Ran, Ran Flamath, uh, who uh, was a, wrote for us many articles on this subject and who was, uh, uh, and had corresponded with uh, Hapgood and was close to him. And 
uh, wrote about a lot of this. He talked about this quite a bit in his original book, uh, which was it was originally called When the Sky Fell. He later changed the name. I've forgotten what he changed uh, the name to. Yeah, because they redid it. Um, yeah, and uh, I can't remember uh, what it's called. Uh, uh, Colin Wilson was involved with him on a lot of that. And oh, uh, that was the Atlantis Blueprint. That was the second one. Well, he, he did, right. He did that, but then he. Uh, well, it wasn't until later that he redid the When the Sky Fell, and he called it the gave it the other name, which I forget. But uh, at any rate, uh, he he talks about this notion. Flamas was one of the people who really believed that uh, uh, Antarctica was where was was basically uh, Atlantis. Yeah, Atlant Atlantis was Antarctica. Atlantis beneath the ice, the fate of the lost continent. Yeah, and so um, there you go. It, it, the and if you look at if you can uh, Hapgood's notion about Earth's shifting crust, which uh, apparently. Einstein uh, agreed to and wrote a foreword for the book, basically saying that he thought this uh, accounted for that. And the idea was that the surface of the earth uh, was like uh, the skin on a bowl of gravy, as they put it, and that it would, uh, that it would, it could shift uh, collectively uh, and that the poles, uh, the poles would move with it, and, but the the surface would uh, would move, and he thought that that at Antarctica was at one time like fifteen thirty degrees further uh, north right. than uh, than we find it, and that there are certainly parts of Antarctica that uh, that if that were true, they would they would be in a they would be in a temperate zone mm -hmm. rather than in the uh, rather than the frozen zone in which we find them, and uh, so I, I at one time I thought that that was really uh, that made a lot of made a lot of sense to me, and I I still think it makes a lot of sense, but it's not I don't think that's what happened, but that's you know that's my my uh, my point of view. It's it's more a matter of. Uh, uh, just opinion than it is a matter of evidence. Well, which don't you think happened? That Atlantis was Antarctica, or that there was a pole shift? Uh, well, I'm not sure as far as that. I mean, I I feel that uh, I think there may I think there is probably there have been pole shifts, but I don't think, in my view, that uh, the radical change that they talk about uh, for Antarctica. In my view, is a little bit is was a little bit too much, but uh, I do think that uh, there have been pole shifts, and uh, I think this. And in fact, I think their pole shifts are still going on, and uh, a lot of the things that uh, I think at one time the pole, the North Pole, was in essentially what's now Hudson Bay, right? And uh, uh, and we've we've did several articles on this and i think that it's something that people should think about a lot more seriously well and that that's that's what i mean when i say like if the, if the so the last magnetic pole was in was in the hudson bay and if you move the earth so that that's the case siberia is in a warm area and so is a chunk of lesser antarctica because i don't know right. how, how else you get those places being temperate because we know they were temperate during the last ice age we have evidence of that um and like you know, what the science doesn't have any good explanation as to why that was the case. When we have these massive ice caps and everything's supposed to be colder, yet the areas that are now frozen were not at the time. Yeah, what and the like the the mammoths with uh, the with uh, butter uh, with uh, with uh, daisies in their belly. Yeah, uh, un uh, still uh, uh, undigested. Undigested, right? Yeah. And uh, there's it's showing that whatever happened happened very, very fast. Right. And I, I think that there was an there. I mean, I, I believe there was a cometary impact. Is my and that uh, uh, I think that uh, you see evidence of that in, um, uh, say, people like Otto Mook talking about the. Uh, 
Carolina bays and so forth, uh, mm -hmm. where you have all these uh, craters here spread across uh, North America, uh, indicating that there was some kind of an impact. And I think that uh, I mean, there, the existence of those craters explains a lot. I know Randall Carlson uh, and Hancock are, uh, uh, you know, among those who, who uh, point to, I mean, incredibly uh, 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 traumatic, uh, uh, catastrophic uh, releases of water from some kind of, a, some kind of event. Uh, and in the in the Northwest, uh, and I think the same thing is true in uh, uh, in in many other areas. I think the Greenland ice cap now uh, has uh, that one of the major craters that they found is beneath the Greenland ice cap. Yeah, and it's been recently brought to light. But I think Greenland was hit probably several times. Uh, and this is, uh, so the question is, what caused, what caused the Younger Dryas? Yeah. And, and I think that, uh, personally, I think that it was probably uh, uh, some kind of uh, large bolide. There are several of them that, that hit the earth. Actually, Robert Schock thinks, uh, he, he believes that it was a... Uh, solar a, outburst. So, so solar outburst. Yeah. Uh, that accounts for most of this evidence. But... Um, I, I don't so, I don't think any of this is necessarily incompatible with the idea of Venus as a comet that Velikovsky suggests, because if Venus was a comet, it probably would have had other debris with it. Um, yeah, and it w maybe that debris is what caused the Younger Dryas, and then a close approach of Venus is what caused the the plasma outburst, not the Sun. Of course, Velikovsky is talking about his Venus event. He thinks was during the. Uh Bronze Age, essentially, right? right? Yeah, the, yeah. And the, so, but whether or not it was Venus or not, it could have been, there could have been some kind of, uh, of uh, passage of, uh, uh, you know, essentially planet-sized object through, through the solar system that could have caused many events. I, I think that there's plenty of evidence that the asteroid belt is actually... Uh, the shattered remains of a planet right and, and i think that there's evidence that uh, certainly uh mars was uh was the victim of some kind of uh of uh, such event uh that created the valleys marineris there and, yeah uh, <laughs> but you know you can't whether or not you can pin things down uh, to a particular scenario, and some people have been very uh, precise about that. I, you know, we talk about uh, uh, Vilikovsky and, uh, uh, I mean, Richard Hoagland has talked about a lot of this in his books mm -hmm. uh, and has an interesting theory, I think, about uh, what happened to Mars and uh, and. And I mean, and then of course, if you look at what we all witnessed on Jupiter uh, with the uh, those um, uh, I forgot the name of the uh, the bolides that hit Jupiter a few years back. Yeah, we we all saw that happen. And if that happened to Earth, I mean, God help us. You know, it would have been there, there wouldn't be any after story on if that had happened to Earth. Yeah, exactly. But, it's Jupiter that shelters us from a lot of this stuff, apparently. But Shoemaker, right, Shoemaker Levy Nine. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> um, and, uh, what what did Hoagland suggest happened on Mars? I don't remember. Well, he, he thought that there was a, a you know that, and I'm not a good uh, uh, translator of uh, of Hoagland's, but he and Barra, Mike Barra. Uh, and we talk about this in in the book, uh, but that there was a uh, essentially a collision uh, between planets that uh, and that's what uh, left this vast catastrophic mm. uh, uh, it, it, uh, detail on Mars. Of course, um, John Brandenburg 
who is a nuclear physicist, uh, he says there's lots of evidence that there was a um, uh, a nuclear event on Mars, and maybe maybe many of them, and yeah. that uh, th there's still plenty of uh, residual um, uh, 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 much nuclear material that really he thinks can't be explained in any other way. Right. And I I guess my point would be in regard to all of this, and we we talk about a lot of these theories in the book, and there are there are many of them, all of which have to be I think should be where there's smoke, there's fire, they all point toward, and there's a kind of commonality that runs through them that, frankly, is echoed in esoteric literature, and that uh, it's, that gets us a lot closer to what probably actually happened than, uh, than uh, we get from uh, mainstream uh, academia. What, what always bugged me about, like, the Cydonia stuff is that, okay, it may or may not be structures. It looks a lot like structures. It has geometry-like structures. There's a lot of reasons to believe that these are actual structures. And NASA just kind of ignored it. And to me, if you were honestly, you know, intellectually honest about this stuff, you'd say, well, if there's even a 5% chance this could be an artificial structure, that's where we should go first. Yeah. They, you'd think they'd get excited. Yeah. And instead, they're, they, they're just like, no, no, it's nothing. You're right. You're exactly right. We're going to go yeah. somewhere else and look for microscopic life. But you might. All right. You can clearly see they're guided by an agenda there and that they, they really don't want to look in certain areas. There's certain things they do not want to see. Yeah. They don't want, they, uh, and um, they don't want to think about them. And it's frustrating when you see that, um, and you have and you have so many like anomalous anomalous stuff that would come out of the space program, and I forget what it was. Was it after the Russian probe or something else where they had something unidentified? And NASA started uh, subcontracting all their stuff out to private companies so they didn't have to release the stuff to the public right away. Are you talking about the uh, the uh, the Russian probe of the uh, moon of Mars, the which was they, knocked out of the sky. Yeah, yeah. Where and uh, <laughs> there's there's just a blizzard of these things. Yeah, uh, and uh, we, in the book we were trying. I tried to uh, to cover as many as we could, and to basically give the you might say the narratives that uh, that uh, is not uh, that most people don't hear. That would help them to kind of get the picture of what what it is that uh, we're saying here. But I wanted not to take sides, right? Uh, and to basically try to endorse any one of these because I, I feel like, uh, for one thing, I don't, I, I can't possibly uh, identify, you, you know, or separate them out uh, like this as to which is which is more valid than the others. But I can tell you that they're, they deserve a hearing mm -hmm. that they've never gotten and that a lot of the ideas that are the mainstream ideas basically strike me as being on a borderline uh, absurd. Yep. Uh, and um, anyway, I, I felt like the best way to approach that would be to talk about as many of these things as, as possible. And then if somebody kind of wants to kind of... Uh, see all of these things at, at, as at, in, in one uh, package, then that's when you start to, to get the, uh, you start to get the real picture. Yeah. And you do a very good job in the book of doing just that, presenting all these different ideas, very unbiasedly. Uh, this is this, this was discovered. And, and some of them are contradictory, you know, like, like some of the ideas that different people have are very contradictory to one another, but you present them pretty equally in there. Right. No, it is that there are, in, it's just, you cannot discuss these subjects without, uh, and, and free them totally of contradictions. And, but I'm not trying to endorse any one of these and saying, well, this is, and I think that's, that's the trap that a lot of us uh, fall into, is you want to commit yourself 
to a particular uh, uh, to a particular belief system, if you will, sure. and then and that then becomes something that you can be hanged for. Uh, <laughs> it, it's much better to preserve your detachment in looking at these and saying, well, this could be, and here's the evidence, or this could be, and here's the evidence, right? And you have to. You pays your money. You takes your choice. <laughs> I, I I definitely have my favorite ideas, but I am very open to uh, changing those. You know, as more evidence comes about. You know, and we don't know. We don't have enough information. It's just kind of like, well, this this at the moment makes the most sense to me, but tomorrow I might learn something that completely changes that. That's why I think that the most you, you know the important thing is the impact that this has on our consciousness. And that's, uh, that's what I wanted to, I, I, I think the uh, effect uh, that um, of, of living in the aftermath of uh, this kind of catastrophic events that we're talking about, and particularly when you factor in things like reincarnation, which I do endorse. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do believe that re I, that you, if you really want to understand uh, the connection between uh, our world today and an ancient world from thousands of years ago, the thing that makes sense in that regard is that we're the same people. Right. And basically, we're basically going through a re-examination of the causes that we have set in motion. And that... Uh, that's the thing that uh, uh, that's the common thread that runs through it, and I think that that was the kind of the missing missing ingredient that um, uh, people like um, uh, Velikovsky had because he wanted to uh, to explain how people could still be influenced by events that had, had occurred um, hundreds of years before, thousands of years before was that there was some kind of race memory that, that kept it going. But I think it's a lot easier to understand when you realize that uh, there's a much closer link between our outer experience and, um, uh, and, the, and the, the memory that we have of, uh, of prior events and that Therefore, we're we really are working. We're trying to work things out, and yeah. we're motivated by a need to get to the heart of things and to discover who we are and uh, and what indeed we 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 are up to here. And and you also can add into that uh, Rupert Sheldrake's idea of the the morphogenic field and all. Uh, yeah, that information is transferred. Like each each species has, sort of has its own information sphere. Right. I just was watching him comment last night, as a matter of fact, on that. He's a great hero of mine. And uh, the idea that uh, we learn things, of course, uh, I think he would say, uh, of course, there's the idea of an extended mind. The mind is not just uh, something that exists in the brain. Right. The brain, the brain is just a kind of a reducing valve or a kind of, uh, and that the that actual mind is much uh is some kind it exists in a much larger matrix, and that uh, our the the brain is like the a television receiver or uh, essentially it's simply a tuning device that uh, uh, gives us access to this larger this larger domain, and in that larger domain we're learning, and as we learn we uh, accelerate in terms of uh, uh, how quickly we learn things. And uh, that's, uh, and that works whether you believe in reincarnation or not. True. I, I mean, that's a, you can, uh, uh, certainly there's evidence that uh, there are ways of knowing and learning things that, occur on at unconscious levels mm -hmm. and uh that's uh and we don't necessarily we're not aware of it in our outer minds but nevertheless is affecting us yeah i was just reading an article yesterday 
uh, on some scientific research that was done showing that people who are working on like the same thing together, like a project together, whether it be music or whatever, their brains actually will sync. And they're really flustered by this because they can't find any material reason how this is happening. It's not like environmental or social cues or anything else. Like their brains literally will work in sync. And if they're working on the same project separately, that doesn't happen. Like it's only when they're cooperatively working together and it, it, it suggests that there's something that is connecting outside of the outside of the brain, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And they and of course that goes against all that the materialists would have us believe. Yeah. Uh, but it's and there you come back to consciousness itself, you know, the so called hard problem, <laughs> which they they don't even want to concede that consciousness exists, but uh, and consciousness cannot be understood. Uh, it, it simply is, and it's not something that can be broken down into some kind of a of a simple explanation, which is what they they'd like to be able to do. Yeah, show it as kind of a product of uh, of biological forces. All right, work. Well, we're just about out of time for this part. There's still a bunch of stuff I want to talk to you about, so uh, we will have you back. Uh, but we're going to do a short Patreon segment, maybe talk about Velikovsky and stuff a little bit. Okay. And uh, so the book is Ghosts of Atlantis, and the subtitle is How the Echoes of Lost Civilizations Influence Our Modern World. Uh, you are J. Douglas Kenyon. And uh, do you have a website or anything? Oh, yeah, it- AtlantisRising.com. Okay. And the book, being out on Inner Traditions or Baron Company, is available everywhere? Yes, it is. And, the- and um, uh, also, we have, uh, we have a YouTube channel we're developing, which oh. is uh, at the Atlantis Rising Research Group. Nice. Okay. And uh, any Facebook presence or anything else? No, I stay away from that. Uh, okay. I, I'm I stay away from the social media. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Well, yeah. thank you. And I look forward to talking to you again. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. A lot of fun. And I want to thank all of my patrons right now for their support. And without you, I don't know if this show would exist. And I want to give an extra special shout out to those pledging $10 or more. Allison Cook, Super Inframan, Eric Hervin, Tim. The 100th Monkey Project, Patricia Gaia Quinta, Alex Whitcomb, Alfred Tuttle, American Rambler, Andrew Maines, Barbara Fisher, Beverly Williamson, Big Boy Limina, Charles Davis, Chris Ernst, Craig Cicernos, Craig Parmenter, David Moore, Denise Sarek, Diane B., Dominic O'Malley, Edu Camahort, MTK, Eric Citron, Eric Todd, J. Otto Bullet, James Lattimore, Joanna Rojas, John Bracken, Carla Mahoney, Kevin, Kevin Schreck, Charles R. Beauregard, Kristen L., Layla Malden, Shane B., Linz Jackson K., Luke Osborne, Mark Bowley, Mark Brady, Matt in Delaware, Matthew Sproul, Maddie, Nagatha Christie, Patricia W., Paul Jeffries, Ray Benedetto, Riker and Stark, Roger Gonzalez, Sam Sharon, Sedgder, Stone Wilderness, Tactical Therapist, Taylor Bell, 36 Dingo, Vincent Trewell, Walker, Will Gebhard, Will Powell, William Lovelace, Red and Collier, and Stephen D. Thank you all so very, very much. So if you're a patron, there's an extra part of this conversation. And, uh, that goes on for another, I think, 45 minutes or so. And I also have another Patreon segment from a few months ago that I never put up that I'm finally going to get up, hopefully this week. So if you're a Patreon, you have a couple of cool things coming your way this week. And uh, again, I want to thank all my patrons because you guys really do make this show possible. And if you want to become a patron, it's only three bucks a month and it helps us out greatly. Just go to wheretotheroadgo.com. You can also help us out by spreading the word of the show uh, telling people a lot about it, leaving us good ratings on whatever podcaster you listen to. Um, that's that's an, also a great way to help us spread the word about the show and uh, get it out to more ears and uh, hopefully bring more people in 
to come up with new ways of seeing this stuff and explore things that much more. So uh, I will see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support.